Introducing the new Starbucks pairings menu, where you can get a tall brewed coffee or tea, hot or iced, paired with a croissant starting at $5, or with a breakfast sandwich starting at $6. Because at Starbucks, we know that some things are better together. Limited time offer at participating stores. Restrictions apply. Visit Starbucks.com slash pairings to learn more. For 25 years, nothing has tasted better after a hard day's work than a Mike's Hard Lemonade. It's because since day one, Mike's has been making lemonade the hard way. We use three kinds of lemons, all hand-picked from family farms, then blended to perfection in cold press to create the epic hard lemonade you know and love. Mike's Hard Lemonade. Hard days deserve a hard lemonade. Mike's is hard. So is prison. Don't drive drunk. Premium all beverage with flavors. All registered trademarks used under license by Mike's Hard Lemonade Company, Chicago, Illinois. You can support this podcast at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, it was a high school rumor. Two skinheads shot a random black man. Can investigators solve a murder when they don't even know who the victim is? We'll talk about the podcast Deep Cover, The Nameless Man. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of the Piper Green series of cozy mysteries, Laura Bricker. Hi, Laura. Hey, Rebecca. And finally, our resident Doubting Thomas, author of the City Trilogy of Novels, host of Strange Arrivals, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, Toby Ball. Hi, Toby. Hi, Rebecca. So, Kevin? Yeah. What's coming up on future editions of Crime Writers On? Well, on Thursday, we've got a really great CWDO Classic Rewind. We're going to go back to our um, review of Class Action Park. Oh, okay. What else are we doing on a future edition of Well, Crime let's Writers see. On, on Monday, we've got a new episode, and we're covering the new Dan Taberski podcast. It's called Hysterical. Oh, that should be a fun one. If It'll just be else. out on Wondery Plus, but it will be out on the, uh, the rest of the podcast feeds uh, soon, and you just cannot wait. I can't wait. You are completely impatient. I am impatient. I am so impatient to do anything by Dan Taberski. How much of it have you heard? As of this taping, yeah, none. Nothing. I know. You're just Do dying. you know why? Why? Because I had to listen to two whole long podcasts for the taping that we're doing oh, right boo-hoo, now. Oh, this is our job. I know. This is our job. It's sad. Yeah, it's sad. <laughs> Hashtag sad. But we have some more time because it's uh, it's summer and we're just new episodes on Monday and great classic rewinds on Thursday. Um. So guys, guess who's back? Um. Our fledgling owls. <laughs> Oh. Last summer we had none. So remember two summers ago we had the fledgling owls and we were like trapped in our home basically. <laughs> They're so loud. At dawn and dusk. They're back. We once again have some fledgling owls and um, we've been hearing them outside of our windows. And last night for the first time I took the dog out at dusk. We have two dogs. I don't want to make you think that one died, but I took one out. I saw swooping like, you know, like 20 or so feet away. And I was like, fuck. And so I took him out, came back in. The other dog had to go out. I was like, shit. I was like, Kevin, you have to come out with me. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that I learned is that if there's more of you, they won't dive bomb and kill you. They're less likely to because when they're young, they're basically learning to hunt, practicing hunting, and you know they they swoop things that have hair or whatever, which is why women get swooped more often than men. So I was like, Kevin, you have to come out with me, and then you know come out. They're like, it's like making the noise in the tree across, and I just feel like we're trapped in our home now. At <laughs> like, we do you can't. need me to rescue you? No. Well, it's- there is an easy solution, but you continue to push back on. No, it. I, I like them. I don't want them to leave. But well, I, you're just ter- we're both terrified. Why wouldn't you want them to leave? <laughs> well, they're they're not. Gonna, what is your malfunction? Well, they're not going to kill us. It's just very suspenseful. It's like that they're not big enough to actually hurt us. They're just they're big enough to swoop you and just like bonk you in the head. Wow, it's yeah. just very suspenseful. But Kevin wants to get one of those big plastic owls to like. Keep, but they don't work anyway, from what I understand. Oh no, they work. They see it as a prayer. It's safe for them. It does doesn't harm them. You're just like, we can't hunt and hit people in this area. That's for that owl to do. Mm. 
We should put that on our Amazon list, the giant owl to deter other owls mm. on our Amazon affiliate link list. See, I'm the opposite. I want to get an owl house so that we can get more of them. What the actual <laughs> fuck? What is... Does anybody understand this? There's, because, Am I the only one that feels like I'm in the bizarre because world? When it's they like get, an adrenaline chunk. No, no, no. Thing. Because yeah. when they get bigger, they don't do that. And they're just really fucking cool. And there was that lady in your town who got like bumped on the head like three times. Yeah. Yes. And they, <laughs> the they really like bump you. They well, really bump you. She had it right. coming. Well, the wife of the former governor got bumped twice. And then that lady got bumped three times because she kept running in the same spot at the same time of morning with her same stupid fucking ponytail. It was her own fault. Yeah, the first time she got all scratched and shit, and then she kept doing it. I don't know what's wrong with her. Anyway. Um, I guarantee after you get struck by an owl, 24 hours later, there's going to be a plastic owl <laughs> sitting out on our, our deck. Yeah. It's but completely humane. Do you like the gi- little holes in our lawn? No. The, the chipmunks? Owls no. will take care of those motherfuckers. They haven't so far. They will, though, when they get bigger. No, they, when they get bigger. <laughs> How about all the beautiful birds that have been coming to our bird oh feeder? Oh my God. You know what they call that? Lunch. <laughs> wow, you've all the trouble getting the special bird seeds yeah. so that cardinals will come. Our bird feeder situation right now is incredible. Yeah, well, Hootie is like so thrilled <laughs> that you did that. You created the Pizza Hut buffet line <laughs> for owls. It's like the California pizza kitchen of... Uh... <laughs> it's like TGI Friday salad bar. It's all you can eat, whatever you want. Just swoop right Gold in. Golden finches. My God. Pileated woodpeckers. <laughs> I almost stepped on a mink yesterday. Ooh, a really? A mink? Really? I was crutching down to the dock, and uh, suddenly I just saw this like blur, and this mink jumped in the water, swam under our dock and out the other side and took off down the rock wall. Yeah. Yeah, it's better than stepping on it. Right. Well, um, I think that we should probably stop chatting at some point. This is, I think, what we do sometimes when we're like <laughs> delaying our review. All I have at my house is I have a ground <laughs> nest of <laughs> wasps or bees. And I thought I was going to have to hire pest removal, but apparently this is part of being a part of a condo. I can call and the management company will send someone. Yeah, to get you're, paying, rid of the, you're paying for that maintenance. Don't right? you have a friend, Mary Weaver, pest reliever? Yes. Well, Mary Weaver, pest reliever is going to send somebody, but I don't need to call her because I guess the condo people will send somebody. Oh, okay. Well, she told me they, that if, if she sent the people, they would they would bring like a pole and like take it in the hole after they put the powder in and they'd wear like a suit, like a space suit to really kill those things. Oh, so it sounds cool. Back. Yeah, yeah. I know. It sounded exciting. Mm. Oh, I, I, anyway. I suspect a new episode of Leave it to Bricker is in the making. All right, Kevin. Should we do it now? Should we talk about the podcast we're supposed to be talking uh, okay. about? Okay, we'll do the crime writers thing. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and drop that first clip right now. Leading off. There had been some rumors that Tom, her ex, was plotting to go after a local cop. And the FBI had asked Scott to look into this, to do a so-called threat assessment. Scott didn't get that much out of this interview with Patricia. But before leaving, he tossed out his Hail Mary question. And that's when she told him about the murder. While conducting a routine firearms background check, a federal agent hears a rumor about Thomas Gibson that dated back to high school. He'd bragged that he and a friend shot a black man to earn a skinhead spiderweb tattoo. Investigators get accomplice Craig Peterson to confirm 15 years earlier they killed a random pedestrian in Philadelphia. But with no name, date, or open case to work from, the agents are at a loss as to how to solve this crime. Who this man might be, they had no idea. But they kept poking around. They wanted to see what they could learn about Tom Gibson and if he had any connections to white supremacist gangs. They're able to match the details to the unsolved death of Aaron Wood, the victim of a random shooting in 1989. But can prosecutors win a conviction for a real-life hate crime working off loose talk and old memories? I think uh, enough people felt strongly that he should go to to prison for some of this. Deep Cover, The Nameless Man, is the fourth season of the investigative podcast from Pushkin Industries. Pulitzer Prize winner Jake Halpert talks to investigators, jurors, and family members about the crime and its implications. How were the authorities' questions answered about who was their victim and the family's questions about who was the shooter? Spoiler alert, we're going to be talking about plot points from Deep Cover, The Nameless Man. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes for our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. 
So, Toby, I found myself listening to this podcast and asking sort of like a Laura Bricker question, right? Why now? Yeah, the, the sort of like, why this case? Did you find yourself asking a similar question? Yeah, and I, I never answered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I could see like the basic idea of having a case where you're pretty sure a murder was committed and you know who did it, but you don't know who the victim was and how that's a problem is kind of interesting. And there are like some interesting things in this, but the story itself just doesn't seem to be enough to carry. Like even like this isn't even like a really long podcast, but I felt like you could have cut like at least one, if not two entire episodes. So yeah, I, I feel like I make this kind of criticism a bunch, but I think you could have made a super interesting like hour, hour and a quarter single episode thing about this case or magazine article. Yeah. It gives you a lot to think about stuff like that. This just feels like it gets stretched. And despite the fact that there are some interesting interviews they have with some interesting people in the end, I was like, wow, we just spent all this time on not a ton so, yeah, I mean, I, I basically agree with that observation. Laura, you have a note, and the first sentence of the note is, talk about an uphill battle. What do you mean by that? Well, it was just like, I'm listening to this. It's like, our murder might have happened. We don't know who or where. Do we really think this is ever going to be solved? Do we know who did it? Do we know who died? Do we know anything about this case? And I was just like, I can't get behind this. We hear about, okay, back in 2004, you know, this Scott guy is visiting with this woman and he's like, well, is there anything else you want to tell me about your ex-boyfriend, Tom? And the next thing you know, it's like, oh yeah, he might've killed somebody because it was like part of this ritual or initiation or like street cred or whatever, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, it was such a stretch to kind of get behind the thread to follow this story that it just, it seemed like an uphill battle to me. Yeah. So, Kevin, there is a sort of a style to this podcast, and part of it is Jake's voice itself. It has sort of like this very, like, L.A. confidential sort of noir sound, mm-hmm. his mm-hmm. delivery. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I would say that I thought as uh, an announcer, I thought he had a really great voice, by the way. I, I agree. They still have this rumor, this side story, that some 15 years prior, back in the 1980s, when Tom was still in high school, that he may have killed a black man in Philadelphia. And, you know, he's an established journalist. And so I thought the writing was pretty good in this. This is not exactly like an investigative podcast where they're trying to uncover different things about an old case. You know, even like last week we were talking about murder on Music Row. And while that was largely a case that's also been done and dusted, Keith Sharon sort of brought some new stuff to it. This doesn't really do that. I don't think it it needs to. The story I thought was interesting. I think I, I'm picking up that maybe I like this just a little better than everybody else. I thought it was very, you know, solid, but maybe not an unusual podcast, a little conventional as far as where it goes from start to finish. I think Laura Bricker's the one who made the comment earlier about this uh, noir saxophone stuff might have been a little overdone trying to achieve an effect here and um, bring up this idea of, you know, this city confidential smoking a cigarette in the back. It sounds like the Perry Mason music. It sounds like they ripped off the music from Perry Mason on HBO. Hmm. Just saying. Well, Toby, there is sort of like one aspect of it that is a little bit like novel-esque, which is the avocations of the two detectives in the case, right? Yeah, so... (laughs) So there, there's two agents who are working on this, an FBI guy and an ATF guy, and they both were going into the clergy at first, but they both decide not to continue pursuing that, and they both become involved in law enforcement. You can see how that would happen, really adjacent fields there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Confess. <laughs> I kind of wish, I mean, it, it's kind of this cool coincidence, and they, they kind of talk about, you know, how it was destined or whatever. These are not men who look at the world and see coincidences. What they see is much closer to fate or God's will. And when they became partners, it all seemed meant to be. Here were two guys who early on looked too skinny and earnest to be cops. Guys who intended to become men of God, different in their own ways. I would have actually been happy to hear more of them or more about them as they went about their stuff. There are like these really interesting little things that happen in this podcast. And that's one of them. Two cops that definitely stands out 
as being, you know, somewhat more memorable. And uh, I, I guess they're just like more like characters than most law enforcement people we hear about in podcasts. I absolutely agree with that. Of all the detective pairings we've heard in different podcasts, I thought this was the most interesting one to me because it isn't just like, yeah, his father was a cop and it was a butcher and he, you know, he worked his way through. And even if we're just, you know, one of the two was somebody who had, had gone to seminary and I just felt a different calling. But the fact they had two of them, and while they're not exactly assigned to each other as partners, like full time, and they just sort of come together on this case, I thought it was unique. And you're right. I just, um, I, I just cannot remember in all of the 600 plus, 700 plus things that we've done, you know, to have a real life pair like that. And you're right. It might have been pretty interesting to hear maybe more from them on their, their different perspectives. I mean, they do touch on that, but maybe it might have been even more there to mine. Laura, it's kind of hard to find who your victim was, right? When you're working backwards, when you when you think a murder may have been committed, but you have no idea who the victim was. Um, how do you, What did you think about that aspect of the investigation? Well, it was just, it was like the clues they're following to find out who was actually murdered. It was like listening to like a super convoluted mystery novel. So it's like, well, Tom, he had a tattoo of a spider web on his elbow and had a teardrop. He liked to brag. He'd gotten it for killing a black man in Philadelphia. He's joining the skinheads. And then you're like, there are 473 murders in Philadelphia that year. How in the heck are they going to hone in on which one this was? I just felt like it was, this was like the needle in the haystack. And you're like, you know, thank goodness they did find that one detective who was able to like pull stats and sort of run things. And also it was like, the description was like, well, it was down this alley and there was like a dark wall behind it. And I'm like, oh yeah, that really narrows it down. There was a dark wall in Philadelphia. We know exactly where the murder took in place. An alley. Like, <laughs> in an alley in Philadelphia. I'm like- Took place between January and May. Yeah. <laughs> Case solved right there. Bing, bing, bing. Okay. We can just wrap this thing up with a neat, tidy bow. I was just like, this is, this is ridiculous. Yeah, like the interesting thing about, you know, just the, the case in general is you're right, where they are working backwards. It's almost like if you walked in and you found a whole bunch of blood, right? And you're like, oh, no, who could this be? But you throw in the aspect of the cold case and the complete, you know, sort of randomness of it that I think this was like, you know, really worth like looking into. But, you know, when you say there's like absolutely no mystery about why you should join us on Patreon. That's right. Because it's a great investment. That's right. We're in the business section. Yeah. You should join the hundreds of new patrons that we had. You know what you can do is you can try us for a week for absolutely free. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You just go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. Sign up. You can hear all sorts of stuff like Rebecca's readathon or Karen read updates. Next week, um, there's going to be a uh, status hearing in maybe. that case, maybe. <laughs> so <laughs> things Re move, change. Rebecca is planning on doing that. Other great podcasts that we have uh, there include Rebecca's OPP, the other people's problems. It's a game show. It's a special for the summer. On the next episode, Rebecca is talking with Sarah Carradine and Mari Forth. Yep. And they're going at it and see like who has the better advice for people's problems. Other great uh, podcasts include Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast. The next book is called The Brothers, The Road to an American Tragedy. It's about the Boston bombing. We also have Laura Bricker's Leave It to Bricker podcast where she solves mysteries. And the mystery that she solved is what happens at a Renaissance fair and what would happen if Laura took a date and they spent their date dressed in costume at the Renaissance fair. One of the things that happens is someone grabs a horn. Mm. Yes. Explain that. I can't just leave that hanging there. It just sounds <laughs> filthy. That sounds filthy. There was a lot of filthy stuff that, well, it wasn't as filthy as I thought it was going to be. It was a much more family friendly event, but there's a lot of accessories at the Renaissance Fair. And one of them was the horns and people had them tied to their belts with like little hooks and things. And you drink out of these horns or quaff, which I think is kind of a gross word. So I'm going to say I'm drinking out of them. So yeah, Lance got a horn and I sort of ran off with it after he filled it up. It held 24 ounces. So wow, it's a lot. Yeah. And, and apparently, <laughs> apparently the turkey legs are greasy to hold. Okay. They are greasy to hold. Great information. Great information. <laughs> Remember, you also can get episodes of Crime Writers on early and ad free if you join at the let's do what we do level we also want to let you know about our amazing amazon storefront where you can see some of our favorite things have you done prime day you know praise it on your calendar here's what you need to do you need to start off by going to amazon.com slash shop slash 
Crime Writers on Bookmark it. Why not? Because you can find out all sorts of our favorite things while you're doing your shopping. Rebecca, what are this week's CWO Amazon recommendations? I'm just going to say some of my favorite pants are available on Amazon. There are these like chino style pants that I love. They're mm-hmm. called Toad & Co. Earthworks ankle pants. They are oh. so fucking flattering and cute. I have them in like four colors and I wear them all spring and summer and fall long. Toad & Co. Earthworks ankle pants. Don't buy the straight leg. Buy the Earthworks ankle pants. They're adorable. And Toby, what are your listener-inspired Toby Balls Deep Cut recommendations? Well, it's summer, Kevin. So I'm going to start off with the Intex 28167EH Easy Set Inflatable Swimming Pool Set. 15 nice. feet by 48 inches, I guess. There's wow. some weird little symbol. 15 feet by 48 inches. That's a big swimming pool. That's a swimming pool. I don't think that would pass my condo board, but I might put it up anyway. It's a lap pool. Uh, including one... It's a lap f- pool. No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> 15 feet is not a very long lap. Includes 1,000 GPH cartridge filter pump, removable ladder, pool cover, ground, cool. CL. Nice. Or maybe it's C capital I. I don't know. A whole pool. That's new. That's incredible. I love that it for is. Us. Uh, another one just came over the uh, transom just a couple minutes ago. Santa's Secret Beard Balm <laughs> Dash Peppermint Candy Cane Scent. Oh, wow. So we know I have a Santa issue, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm now dating a man with a beard. Oh, nice. You know what I had to get? Some of that Santa's Beard Balm. It's very fetishizing of you, Laura. <laughs> yeah. Lance doesn't really look like a Santa, though. Except for the be- except for the fact that he, he has smells a beard. like one now, though. I guess he does. Tell Lance I didn't mean to demean him in his beard. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh my God! To so do all that by going to Amazon.com/slash/shop/slash/CrimeWritersOn, we earn commissions on qualified purchases. All right, Kevin. Before we end the business section, I have a very important question for you. Yeah. Do we have any Patreon patron saints of the week this week? Our Patreon patron saints are George Hines. And Colleen Knight, bless you. George, Colleen, bless you indeed. Bless you to everybody who's on our Patreon. Bless you to everybody who's recently joined us, who's been with us for a long time. Maybe you just joined us today. Bless you. Bless you. If you're thinking about joining us, I really encourage you to try us out. If you used to belong and don't or can't anymore, we love you anyway. And if you're never going to join, but just listen to this podcast and muscle through the business section, we love you too. All right, Kevin, should I go ahead and fade that music out right now and end this business section? Yes, this ends the business section. Let's get it done. Kevin, who's our next wonderful sponsor for this podcast? Uh, we're brought to you by Quince. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, whenever uh, you're gearing up for your next trip, deciding what to pack is always so stressful. And the clothes that you have either don't fit or they're worn out and they just don't match. And you need to be refreshed because when you go on vacation, you want to feel great. So say hello to Quince. Seriously, say hello to Quince. Your new go-to for high quality vacation essentials that you'll be packing for trips to come. Rebecca, you actually just surprised me with a nice seasonal accoutrement. Kevin, the linen stuff at Quince is incredible. I've bought myself a couple of linen shirts, like the camp style linen shirts, and I tie them at the waist and wear them all the time. We were just on a car trip, and I was like, Kevin, I wear this black one all the time. I think I should get another one in a different color. Did it right then, and I ordered one for you, and you love it, do you not? I do. I love my uh, linen uh, jacket that you purchased for me, so I look... Like, I used to go on a yacht. I don't know anybody with a yacht, but I really want to go on a yacht just so that (laughs) I can wear that. Yeah, all Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes. Pack your bags with high-quality essentials with Quince. Go to Quince.com slash crime for free shipping and 365-day returns. That's quince.com. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash crime. Get crime. free shipping and 365 day a year returns. Quince.com slash crime. Crime. Hey, Green Gobbler here. So you've got a clogged drain in your bathroom. Water in the sinks, overstaying its welcome. You're spitting today's toothpaste on top of yesterday's toothpaste. You hope that it go away. Yeah, clogs don't just go away. I make them go away. I'm Green Gobbler, the only clog dissolver you need. I'm bleach-free, safe for your pipes, and I work. Guaranteed or your money back. 
Because I never met a clog that was going to unclog itself. Green Gobbler. Let the Gobbler get it. So, Kevin, who's our next sponsor for this program? Ah, uh, we're brought to you by Shopify. Ooh. So, Rebecca, okay, so I don't think I've ever asked you this. So, we're going to we'll do a quick podcast crossover. Rebecca, who is your favorite Law & Order detective team? Favorite Law & Order detective team. Briscoe and Green. Uh, yeah, I would also go, uh, I'd go Briscoe and Curtis. Um, Ooh. Yeah, because they are partners who get things done, right? They're able to solve the case, except, of course, the time when they arrest the wrong guy and it's McCoy who's got to bail him out. That's a whole <laughs> other problem with the justice system, but we'll get to that later. We've got great partners, though, with you and Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage to the first Real life store stage all the way to, 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 did we just hit a million order stage? Of the two of us, I am the online shopper, yes or no? You are. Shopify, I know the interface as a shopper, super easy to use. If you are selling stuff online, get Shopify. It's just like a click and you are out of there. Nothing worse than like putting something in the in the in the cart to check out and it's a whole technical mess gotta and you just go walk get away. my wallet gotta go blow no shopify man shopify you lose that sale sign up for a one dollar per month trial period at shopify.com slash crime writers crime writers all lowercase go to shopify.com slash crime writers crime writers now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in shopify.com slash crime crime writers, writers. So, Toby, we learn in this podcast that if somebody lives in Vermont, they're definitely hiding out from a crime. Yes. Thoughts? So weird. Uh, yeah. So, like, everybody else in my family lives in Vermont. So They're hiding. They're in hiding, Apparently, Toby. there's stuff I don't know. The Toby Ball criminal family, the crime family. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. And it was like, it's really cold up there, which is true. What a shithole, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was a strange thing. It's like, what if you want to duck from the cops from Maryland? I'm oh, just going to say, to his house with a view on top of a mountain sounds like a real fucking shithole, right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it immediately had me thinking about uh, that guy from Ireland who went on the lamb and oh, ended yeah. up like living in a trailer in uh, the Rockies. I was like, that's hiding Moving to Vermont is just moving. People just, leave, people just leave you alone in Vermont and let you do your own thing. Yeah, you go yeah. up there, you want to listen to a little fish, get some Ben and Jerry's. Yeah. Thank God their flawed reasoning was correct. Yeah. We found out he's in, he's in Vermont, like a remote part of Vermont. And I remember I, I said, this dude's hiding, man. He's hiding. I said, that cat from Wilmington, Delaware, living in Vermont, man. I said, dude, it gets cold up there, man. I mean, that's a cold place, bro. So, Laura, Jake expresses some surprise that once Craig is caught, he's granted immunity by the feds. Were you surprised by that? Not really. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, they're like, Craig must really know what he's talking about. And I'm like, um, if you watch any sort of TV, you know you can ask for immunity. Like, this isn't like rocket science. I'm like, Craig knew the murder took place around the spring of 89. He's talking about going to a senior prom. They come in, they say, were you the shooter? No. Were you involved? Yes. Okay. Immunity. And they're like, this is like the shocking thing we've ever heard. And I'm like, no, not really. But do we take Craig as credible? That is the question. I, I think so. I don't know, Laura. I don't know, though. I mean, who the fuck knows? He's racist skinhead, well, guys. Well, well, hold on a second. I, th I think, let me just push back slightly on that, because I think the issue there was about the expediency at which immunity was granted. Exactly. And the only reason that that matters is in the end, it comes down to, who do you believe? Because Craig has the murder weapon. Right. Right. And he puts himself in the car. Right. Does he have the tattoo as well? Yeah. So while I agree, it's not like a big mystery, but it, it is important that maybe we think about, oh, were they too hasty? Because certainly the defense is going to make that argument. Absolutely. Um, and we do, of course, spend some time with the victim's family here or the alleged victim's family because... We'll get to it, but we hear that they believe that they found the victim in the case, Aaron Wood, and we spend a lot of time with the family. Laura, do you think that it was an effective use of our time and their time and that we got a, a good look at sort of victim impact in the podcast? 
Yeah, I mean, I think this podcast kind of struck me as like one of those like straightforward sort of true crime story in the way that it's told. And it has, you know, the perspective of of all the different people that were there, right? So we have like the setup to the crime. Okay, now here is the niece of the guy who was murdered of Aaron Wood. She's talking about her memory of the night that her uncle died and how they're like gathered at the grandmother's house and how she's like, is this real? Is this something that really happened? Or have people just talked about it so much because this is part of the family? But then she talks a lot about how it affected her grandmother. She wish she could have did things a little different, but you can't. You can't. And I told it all to her. I said, you can't. You can't say that because you you did the best you could with what you have. Like I told her, I said, you didn't slack on him. You did the best you could under the circumstances. For years, it was just like, this was something that was very heavy over this family. So when there's an opportunity for them to have some closure, this is something that they're all sort of, I want to say rallying behind, but gravitating towards in a way that they're hoping there is going to be closure because it has been something that really was like, a you know, this sort of unsolved what happened to our relative. So I think it was good to have that in there. But it was like, again, there was nothing in terms of just the way that this podcast was laid out. It was very traditional. It was like, okay, crime murder victim's family, people involved, trial, verdict, the end. Right. So I'm going to talk in a minute about why I have serious doubts about whether or not Aaron Wood was actually the murder victim. But Toby, I see that you have a note too about the possibility that Aaron was not the victim. What do you think about the amount of time that we spent with his family in the podcast? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the thing is, was he really the victim? Like that's never established So we basically spend an episode learning about the family of a victim, Mm -hmm. but maybe not the victim that this podcast is about. And and it's not to diminish this family's experience and the death and stuff, but unless it's really the person who this happened to, it feels a little strange, right? I mean, Mm. it's like, oh, let's hear about a family who does have a, a family member who died in an unsolved homicide. Right. So if it was me making this podcast... I think I would have thought long and hard about whether I really wanted to go forward with this one, because if if it wasn't him and there's plenty of reason to believe that maybe it wasn't, it just doesn't really have much to do with the story. Right. Yeah. So there's a reason why I said what I said. And, you know, Kevin, I saw you have a note about this, too. When I first heard the name Roger King come up in this podcast, I was walking when I was listening to this podcast and I literally stopped short. Later in the podcast, Jake says as a very quick passage about Roger King's, quote, complicated legacy or complicated history. Roger King does not have a complicated history. Roger King has a horrible history. Roger King is basically the reason why there's a conviction integrity unit in Philadelphia. Roger King was at one point responsible for 20 percent of death row convictions in the state of Pennsylvania. Roger King has, if you Google him quickly, you can see at least seven major wrongful conviction exonerations to his name. There are many, many, many more. Some of them are still being uncovered. Four undisclosed cases that they did before that show ended were all Philadelphia cases. Roger King prosecutions. Roger King falsified evidence. Roger King withheld evidence. Roger King prosecuted cases where cops literally wrote confessions, signed confessions and pretended that they were suspect confessions. The police in Philadelphia at the time of this case were so unbelievably corrupt in the way that they investigated and worked with the DA to to solve and prosecute cases that the solve is not trustworthy to me. And I think that the incentive to solve, and I know the feds are involved here too, but I, I, I just don't trust it. I don't believe it. And I was completely shocked that the podcast stopped there. The podcast stopped at he had a, quote, complicated history. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not as dubious about the connection between this defendant and that victim as everybody else's. I mean, there is some ballistics evidence here. And we've already established that this is pretty hard to, you know, make the same kind of connection because of this cold case and because it it was completely What kind of ballistics evidence was there? Well, they say that there were similarities in the gun with the bullet that was in his head. Right. But that that kind of evidence is bullshit. That pattern evidence is not right. It doesn't work. Okay. Well, I would say I'm not going to fault the journalist for saying, 
no, this was completely the wrong person because that's not how this played out. Right. I mean, I, I get it. Like the, the real question here is whether there's enough evidence mm. and whether you can meet that burden beyond a reasonable doubt. And we hear from the jurors about that. Right. That's where I am. Both things can be true. King seems to be a very problematic prosecutor. But I find it hard to believe that we should start from the point when, as a journalist, when you pick this up, that no, it was the wrong guy. It was the wrong victim. And we shouldn't believe any of it. If I, I, were, I just, if that's, I, my, that's my position. I, I get That's it. my position. I'll tell you, if I were looking at a case and then it, came, it ended up in a trial and it was a Roger King trial, I would end the reporting right there. Unless, <laughs> unless the story became, because it's very interesting to me, I think, because what ends up happening, Laura, we can talk about this, is what they talk about the jury did is they convicted him for a murder, but not this murder, right? Right. They came up with this comment. I'm like, that was actually the right fucking call. Because I honestly, as a journalist, if it came to a Roger King case, you'd literally just have to Google Roger fucking King. There's whole websites about Roger King. There's whole wrongful conviction websites about Roger fucking King. Laura Bazelon tweets about Robert King. Like Larry Krasner ran on Roger King's fucking record. Like there's a whole... PBS documentary about Roger King's record. Like it just to me was like shocking that the treatment of him on this in this podcast was so like credulous. Laura, what did you think about the jury foreman's and the jury members takes here? Because and when I was listening, I was actually sort of like I was kind of glad that they weren't convicted for for murdering this specific person. Yeah, I think it was a really just verdict. So, yeah, we've got Bob the juror and he's saying he finds the girlfriends, the two ex-girlfriends and Craig credible. But then he says, well, somebody can be credible about something that happened 20 years ago and not remember it completely correctly. And that is that, you know, eyewitness testimony and memory. We know that's that's something that comes in a lot. And then he talks about there was like a holdout. And it was this one guy who was like, I am an island unto myself and I want to quit Tom on all counts. And he was not budging. There was a sense Tuesday morning that that we we're out of time, essentially. There was no more persuasion to happen. We'd all, you know, made our cases based on notes, based on recollection, based on feelings. And the, the holdout was not budging. How do you navigate out of that situation? Uh, so we negotiated. They acquit him on the first degree murder and the ethnic intimidation, but they find him guilty on the lesser charges. And so the family is wanting closure. Everybody wants closure. But at the same time, I think this sort of split the this split the baby. And like, I think it came out in a way that both sides could be able to take something from it. But also... This case was just so fucking bonkers. I still just have a lot of questions about who was actually involved and if this thing that went to trial was actually what we thought it was, right. if that makes sense. So, like, I, I don't know, but I'm like, okay, this seems like an okay verdict. Like, both sides got a little something, but we didn't send this guy away forever on something that maybe might not have been him. Yeah, compromise verdicts are also problematic too because it's like preponderance of evidence is guilty or not guilty, not let's compromise. <laughs> That's also kind of problematic. Well, it was less compromise because that one guy wouldn't hold, you know, the one guy was just like, fuck you all, I am not, I have my flag, I'm Toby Ball in the timber taking trial and I am not budging. <laughs> uh, Toby, the podcast also prevaricates a little bit on whether or not these skinhead guys were um, Nazis or not or racist or not, right? <laughs> Well, one guy had a Nazi tattoo, so that makes me think that he had some problematic racial thoughts. Uh, you know, there are racist skinheads and there's anti-racist skinheads and there's, you know, straight edge skinheads and blah, blah, blah. So I think it's convenient if you're accused of killing a random black man to say, oh, I was one of the ant I was one of the non-racist skinheads. Like, <laughs> of course, you're going to say that. But when you got a, you got a swastika. Uh, that just seems like bullshit. I'm a blue collar skinhead. Yeah. As opposed to all those executive skinheads. <laughs> super. Because really super skinheads rich. are all white collar, right? Yeah. I mean, quite literally they're white collar, <laughs> not blue collar, blue collar skinheads. I, 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 I like his, his lawyer punched him below the swastika on his like, arm. Oh. You, you did great. <laughs> Good job, Adolf. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you come to court, make sure you got the long sleeve shirt. Okay. <laughs> yeah. These are things if I was working as an investigator on a defense team, I would be in charge of. Like going out and getting the long sleeve pastel shirt for the skinhead guy. But even Jake like gave him a little shit about like, oh no, he's, you know, he's the non-racist skinhead. Like, but doesn't he have a Hitler tattoo? Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, like, Hitler, yeah. Schmittler, you know. Well, you know, yeah. it's, 
That's yeah. not it. It's an aesthetic, you know? <laughs> it's just he had to collect them all. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's like Pokemon. He was trying to, you know, he grew. All the fascist it, it leaders. It was a phase. It was a phase. <laughs> you should see his Mussolini. Can't, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, the, the, at the end, we sort of get this philosophical question, right? What does it say about the world that somebody could do something like this? Or even that somebody, you know, it's like, if he didn't do it, isn't that better? If he just thought about it, or if he did do it, like, what does it say about us as a society, right? It's like asked like this very profound question. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, that just seemed naive. <laughs> I mean, I know, like, you know, we try to, like, come up, what's the moral of the story here? And, like, well, what, I mean, what does it say about, you know, the fact that you could just randomly kill somebody and just walk away from it? And then we find excuses as to why we can't solve, why we can't punish it. I mean, for, you know, for the most part, I'm like, that's hardly a revelation. If you've been looking at man's inhumanity to man through the lens of true crime for the past 10 years, but. Or through the news. Or through the news. But, you know, I mean, it's a rhetorical device used in, in narrative. I don't I don't think it's a question that we can answer because we already pre-assume the answer, which is that, yeah, people suck. And sometimes people are hateful. And, yeah, the guy with the Hitler tattoo uh, probably 100 percent did kill a random black guy underneath a, str- a lamppost in Philadelphia in 1989. Whether it was this guy to be determined. I don't or think not. to be determined. I, don't I, know. I, I do. Guess, I know. All right. I do. What do I you guess, think, Rebecca? What do you think? As I said before, serious, serious doubts. At Mayo Clinic in Florida, we're seeing the unseeable. Using advanced imaging technology, our experts can look deeper into the human body, uncovering the smallest of details that would otherwise go unnoticed, leading to more accurate diagnoses and treatments. We're making more possible at Mayo Clinic because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible Mayo Clinic you know where to go Robert Picton one of the worst serial killers a new true crime series from Freeform a lot of victims are people who are in the margins when all else fails there's possibly many more victims nobody cares Sasha Reed and her team take the case we're coming for you I just want answers we're gonna do absolutely everything to get closure to these cases the whole thing is a cover up there's so much more here. Freeform, Sasha Reed, and the Midnight Order. New episodes Wednesdays. Stream We're on Hulu. The South Dakota Stories, Volume 7. My trip to South Dakota was the best summer ever. Now, I don't need to go to Mars. Because I've been to the Badlands. And I caught a bigger walleye than Dad when we went to the Missouri River. Then, I rode my bike through these huge rocks called needles. Ooh, I also saw my first herd of bison, even a fuzzy furry baby one. I can't wait to go back and see more. There's so much South Dakota, so little time. If your child is struggling in school, then IXL is right for your family. IXL is an online learning program for kids that covers math, language arts, science, and social studies. Backed by research, kids using IXL are scoring higher on tests. It's no wonder it's used in 95% of the top 100 school districts in the U.S. Plus, a month of IXL costs less than an hour of tutoring. Get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when you sign up today at IXL.com 20. Visit IXL.com 20 to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price. All right, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out Deep Cover, The Nameless Man? Laura Bricker, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for this podcast? I'm thumb sideways on this podcast. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. It was bogged down in areas where I felt like there was a lot of buildup and there was a lot of repetitive information at times. So I'm like, oh, we just heard this. And then 10 minutes in, they'd be like, welcome to Deep deep Cover. And I'm like, but we just heard 10 minutes of the story that we're now rehearing. So that for me was frustrating. I was kind of like, I'm going to say it. I can't believe, why now? why this case. It was just a very traditional, straightforward true crime podcast. But overall, I didn't find anything about it that made me be like, oh, I can't wait to listen to the next episode. So that is why I'm thumb sideways. Toby Ball, thumbs up or thumbs down for Deep Cover, The Nameless Man. So I think there's an interesting question at the center of this podcast. Uh, I won't say what it is because I, I think it spoils some of it. And I think it's worth exploring. I feel like this case doesn't really carry a podcast of this length. You know, the reporting is good. There's definitely some interesting interviews and people along the way. But again, it, it just, and I, and I realize I, I say this, 
fairly frequently these days, but I, I just don't know if there's enough there to make a podcast of this length. You know, one of the nice things about podcasts, is you don't have a set number of episodes you have to make, but you don't have a whole lot of two or three episode podcasts that we review. And this kind of felt like that would have been sort of the ideal length for this thing. So I guess I'm a thumb sideways. I mean, it, it doesn't suck. But again, I just I, I feel like they have like these components that would have made a good podcast if there had been just a little bit more to this case that they could have sunk their teeth into. And instead, you have an interesting central question and a bunch of things around it that are kind of interesting. And then even more things around it that kind of felt like either filler or sort of not exactly side excursions, but wouldn't have been something that you'd have included in a really tight podcast. So for that reason, I'm thumb sideways. Kevin Flynn. I'm a, I'm a mild thumbs up for this. I'm going to having spent the month reading a lot of important dissents. I'm going to uh, just dissent on something from the review there. We know that they make an arrest and they identify the victim. I don't feel that the podcasters were irresponsible or that they never should have done this podcast because part of the question is whether or not they got the right victim. I just I don't I think that's terribly unfair to everybody that makes the podcast. I think though that if you, you know, want to explore that issue, it's interesting. You just really can't like go into it saying like I have a vibe that's wrong as opposed to evidence that was produced or at least that it's irresponsible for the journalist to not advocate that position. That being said, I thought that the you know reporting was pretty solid again. This isn't an investigation about what might have happened, what might have happened. It's sort of a recap. Uh I did like the journalist, uh, the host here Jake Alpert you know, I think that, that it's solid and serviceable, not the greatest podcast, but not bad, very conventional. I think they selected a story that was unlike any other there as far as what the challenges were and how they addressed it. So uh, I'm a thumbs up. Yeah, this is a really tough one for me because this is a really well made podcast. It sounds really good. I really like Jake Halpert a lot as a host, and I know that he's a really strong journalist. But there's just a really big journalism flaw here, like a really, really, really big one. Um, and I don't necessarily know that the story should have been canned, but it's extremely incomplete um, and it is credulous in a major way. And I don't know whether or not they have the right person or not, but neither for sure, in my opinion, does the podcast, but they think they do. And that's problematic given a major thing that we talk about in the review um, that was really easily discoverable. I, I think that they knew it. They, they thought that they did their due diligence with it by the listener, but they didn't. And I think that a lot of true crime listeners also know this information because it's been the subject of so many other pieces of media. So this is really hard. It's so hard to give this a thumbs down because it's not a bad podcast. So I'm going to go sideways. I'm going to go sideways. Uh, I just can't go down because it's just not it's not terrible. But um, yeah, I'm going sideways for uh, Deep Cover, The Invisible Man. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast. A little something I like to call the crime, crime of, the week. of the week. They're smarter than us. They're stronger than us. Some even have sex with us. But robots really can't express happiness like we do until now. Scientists in Tokyo have been able to make a robot smile by covering it with a flexible living skin compound. The two-dimensional robot, complete with plastic eyes and pug nose, is able to move its globulous wet skin with mechanical attenuators, bulking up the cheeks and simulating a grin. They say it's all part of their research into making a synthetic skin that's flexible and doesn't tear. The long-term goal is to create a self-healing artificial flesh for wounds and plastic surgeries. The skin could also be placed over the mannequin head of an android to make it look more lifelike. Combine human-looking robots with artificial intelligence, and you've got the beginnings of Skynet and six Terminator movies. So panel, why so unserious? What do you think this disgusting robot was looking at? My reaction to seeing the picture of this robot, it's which disgusting. I think my, my entire neighborhood heard when I started screaming and shrieking it's when animated. I opened up. It moves. I was yeah. like, oh my God. It's nasty, right? I, I'm going to have nightmares. Thanks, Kevin Flynn. It looks like a clam, like a raw It looks like a clam. vagina. <laughs> smiling vagina. Toby Ball, why do you think this robot is smiling? 
I haven't seen a picture of it, so I'm just processing what I just heard. Toby, it looks like a vagina. It's Don't like, look at it. It's like open up a <laughs> clam. Check, and check it's out like your a, slack. It's like it's it in smiles it. at you. <laughs> yeah, I just assume it's just thinking, you stupid motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, what do you think this robot's smiling at? Because they just told them the other part they're putting flesh on. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us. Before we go, Laura Bricker, do we have a cat of the week this week? <laughs> cat number two comes to us from Michelle Basley. Her cat, Sophia, who is in a cat cave that is really cool, wants more daily content about the readathon, more true crime content nice. Sophia the cat would like. So that is our cat of the week. And the picture is really awesome. I'm a super fan of this picture. Look at this cat in its cat cave. Aww. Mm. You guys know I'm tired, right, for making this daily podcast. But if you like it... <laughs> I'll keep trying to do something as often as I can because people seem to really like it. I'm going to have to quit my job. Jesus fucking Christ. All right, Laura Bricker, if folks want to reach out to you and send you pictures of their animals to be animal of the week of any kind, how can they find you online? You can find me at Lara Bricker on Twitter and Instagram. And Toby Ball, if folks want to see your armless shirt, how can they find you online? <laughs> at Toby Ball NH. What about you, Kevin? If people want to see that disgusting, smiling robot, how can they find you online? I'm at Kevin P. Flynn. You can follow the P stands for putrid. <laughs> you can follow me everywhere at Reb Lavoy. You can follow the show everywhere at Crime Writers On, but mostly I encourage you to join our incredible Facebook group. The folks there are rad. Of course, you can get everything cool that we we make, including my somewhat daily, it's been daily podcast about Karen Reed at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. We got a game show. We got Laura's show. We got Toby's show. We got so much cool stuff, including the after show. Again, that's patreon.com slash partners in crime media. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our editor is the exceptional Livy Burdett, who is definitely not a robot. The executive producer of this show is Kevin Flynn. This show was recorded in Studio C, The Closet, in our New Hampshire basement where we also have given up the seminary in order to pursue our calling of fighting crime. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. later. There's like a strong potential that my niece will marry a Scottish guy, which will be my first like legit excuse to wear a kilt. So oh. you'll wear a kilt, Toby, if you go to the wedding? I fucking hope so. Toby, if you wear a kilt, I need video. There'll be a lot of pictures, trust <laughs> me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Social media content for years. I'll have to get the extra long one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they once, uh, there was a woman who Wait, asked. I didn't mean that in a dirty way. I just mean you're tall. <laughs> <laughs> Toby needs an extra long kilt. Uh, did you I'll know? I'll take it whatever way, <laughs> whatever way it was intended. <laughs> <laughs> At Mayo Clinic in Florida, we're seeing the unseeable. Using advanced imaging technology, our experts can look deeper into the human body, uncovering the smallest of details that would otherwise go unnoticed, leading to more accurate diagnoses and treatments. We're making more possible at Mayo Clinic because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.